The My Free Taxes Self-Employed Tax Guide, Tax Preparation for Small Business Owners, sponsored by My Free Taxes and the United Way. The information contained here has been prepared by Civitas Strategies Early Start and is not intended to constitute legal, tax, or financial advice. The Civitas Strategies Early Start team has used reasonable efforts in collecting, preparing, and providing this information, but does not guarantee its accuracy, completeness, adequacy, or currency. The publication and distribution of this information is not intended to create and receipt does not constitute an attorney client or any other advisory relationship. Reproduction of this information is expressly prohibited. Welcome to the My Free Taxes Self-Employed Tax Guide for Small Business Owners. In today's video, we will discuss key tips that will allow you to self-prepare your sole proprietor business taxes. We have a two-part guide that we've developed to help you self-prepare your business taxes. The first part is getting ready for tax time. This gives an overview of basic tax concepts and business practices that will help strengthen your business now and into the future. It also includes helpful worksheets that you can use. Part two is filing your return online. Through My Free Taxes, you can file your federal and state return online free of charge. To help you complete the business portion of your return more easily, this part walks you through self-preparing your Schedule C step-by-step -step using the free online software available through My Free Taxes, including helpful screenshots and explanations. United Way created this guide to help more self-employed business owners easily and accurately file their taxes for free. Designed for both full-time and part-time entrepreneurs, this guide takes you through the steps of getting ready to self-prepare your taxes using online software. According to the IRS, in 2019, there were over 27.8 million sole proprietors, also called self-employed individuals, running businesses in the United States. Sole proprietorships can include a person selling crafts on Etsy as a side hustle to a takeout restaurant with multiple employees. They all have one thing in common. They report their business earnings and determine their taxes using a Schedule C. While there are many examples of self-employed business owners, here is a short list of who that may include. An Etsy seller, retail store owner, restaurant owner or baker, Toro host, consignment or reseller, photographer, barber or a hairstylist, makeup artist, cleaning services, or an event planner. In this short video, we will talk through the use of the guides and highlight key text topics for your business type so that you can self-prepare with confidence. Those topics are reducing your audit risk, understanding your Schedule C, calculating your business use of home and vehicle, and resources to help you with your taxes. Small businesses play a critical role in our economy, generating income and wealth that supports the financial needs of entrepreneurs, employees, and their families. However, the costs and stress associated with filing business-related taxes limit the positive financial impacts of self-employment for many entrepreneurs. Taxes are an important consideration for any business. Through taxes, we all contribute to our government at the national, state, and local levels. As a business owner, they are a cost that reduces your profit. While you should always heed IRS regulations, 
you will likely want to reduce any costs to your business, including taxes. Effective tax preparation can head off the long-term costs of an audit. Though only a relatively few people are audited every year, if you are audited, the cost and time and money can be great. The best way to avoid an audit is to keep in mind common red flags. That is, the issues that often lead to an audit. The most common red flags for sole proprietors are not including all your income on your taxes, such as leaving out a 1099 you received from one side hustle even though you reported the income from your day job, taking off too many expenses or ones that are really high, like claiming $40,000 in cell phone expenses, but your business doesn't require high phone usage. Taking a very large loss on your business or having losses year after year. Businesses will take a loss from time to time, but you want to avoid having losses that are far in excess of what you've earned. After all, if your business regularly loses more money than it earns, the IRS may be curious about why you continue to operate it. Not reporting app payments such as those through Zelle, Cash App, or Venmo. Misclassifying an employee as a 1099 contractor and not paying employment taxes on their wages. Claiming 100% use of your vehicle. Some of you may have a van or car you use for transportation for your business. That is allowed. However, Reporting that the vehicle is only used for work and never for personal reasons can draw attention since it is less common. As you see, many of the red flags can be easily avoided through proper preparation of your taxes. There are a number of different tax forms. Income for a sole proprietorship is reported on a Schedule C form as part of your personal 1040 tax return. If you have more than one business and they are not closely related in nature, you will need more than one Schedule C. For example, if you have a craft business on Etsy and drive for Uber or Lyft, you will find that you will need two Schedule C forms. When completing your Schedule C, you first report your revenue, that is, all the money you received from your business. You then show all your expenses, which are the things you paid for to keep your business running, and then you calculate the amount that remains. If it is positive, you made a profit. If negative, then you had a loss. Let's take a closer look at the Schedule C to view the different sections for reporting data on your business. If you use tax software, it will enter these numbers based on your answers to certain questions, but it can still be helpful to know your way around this important document. Part one is where your sales are totaled and your cost of goods sold is reported so you can see your gross profit. Part two is where your business expenses are reported. There are over a dozen categories listed to help you stay organized, such as advertising, car and truck expenses, legal and professional services, rent, travel and meal expenses, and other costs. The last section is where your net profit is calculated, which is line 31. It is calculated by subtracting your total expenses from part two from the total revenue in part one. Your net profit is considered your income from self-employment.
The first section of your taxes is all about revenue. That is, how much money you made. Getting this information may be easy if you have an accounting system. If not, no worries. You can use the revenue worksheet included in the guide to calculate it. You'll start by gathering your records. You are likely to have three types of records for your business revenue. 1099 forms. These are evidence that another business paid you for services, such as a 1099 NEC, also known as a 1099 NEC, received for providing services on a consulting contract, totaling $1,200 for the year. You may also receive a 1099-K if you received more than $600 in business payments from apps like Square, Zelle, or PayPal. Your bank records. These show additional funds you may have received from other sources. Keep in mind, even if you did not receive a 1099, you still need to report the business income and your own documents, such as your books or accounting system that has revenue recorded. Next, fill out the revenue worksheets. This is optional, but can help jumpstart your tax filing and keep you organized. Be sure to include each 1099 and other income you have received. Just remember, do not include your W-2 employment wages here. Your W-2 employment income, like what you may receive from your day job, should be reported in the income section of your tax return and not on the Schedule C. Now that you have your business income, you need to collect your expenses, i.e. what you spent money on for your business in 2022. You want to make sure you have records of your costs, ideally receipts showing payment for expenses, but you can also, in most cases, use cancel checks, invoices, or credit card and bank records. It is critical that any proof of an expense show that you paid the expense, the amount you paid, the date you paid it, and a description of the item purchased or service received. The one exception is mileage deduction for your vehicle. In this case, you should have a simple log with the date, the distance you went, where you went, the purpose, business or personal, and as specific as possible. The mileage log included as a resource in the guide is a simple log you can use to fill in your vehicle use information. To collect your expenses, begin by collecting all your receipts. Next, go month by month in your records for 2022 to review your credit card bills, check at base system payments, look at your bank statements and checks. With records of your expenses in hand, you can now fill out the expense worksheet included in the guide. The worksheet uses the expense categories for a Schedule C that are most relevant to sole proprietors. You should hold on to all proof of payment through the tax season and at least four years after. It's great to have electronic copies as well as paper ones, even if that is just snapping a picture of each with your phone to save in your Google Drive tax folder. Including the cost of your home. Understanding the business use of home deduction. Sole proprietors may use part of their home in their business. For example, if you are a writer, you may have a home office. There are some key guidelines, however, around this deduction that you want to keep in mind. The first and most important thing to consider is if the space in your home is exclusively used for business. That means that it is only used for your business. If the space is partially used for business and partially for personal purposes, it will not qualify. 
There is an exception to this, however, which we will discuss shortly, that applies to spaces used to store inventory. In addition to the exclusive use requirements, the space must be your primary business location. If you are a driver, for example, your home is still likely your primary business location since it is where you keep all your records and run the business. To qualify under the exclusive use test, you must use a specific area of your home only for your trade or business. The area used for business can be a room or other separately identifiable space. The space does not need to be marked off by a permanent partition, so it is all right if you don't have a wall, for example, around your home office as long as the area you use is distinct. Again, you do not meet the requirements of the exclusive use test if you use the area in question for both business and for personal purposes. The one exception is for spaces in your home used to store inventory. If you use part of your home for storage of inventory or product samples, you can deduct expenses for the business use of your home without meeting the exclusive use test. However, you must meet all of the following tests. You sell products at wholesale or retail as your trade or business. You keep the inventory or product samples in your home for use in your trade or business. Your home is the only fixed location of your trade or business. You use the storage space on a regular basis. And the space you use is a separately identifiable space suitable for storage. Let's look at a few examples. Erica does freelance translation on weekends. Depending on the day, she sets up her laptop in one room or another. Since none of the spaces are being exclusively used, she cannot deduct them. If she decided to set up a separate room in her apartment, which she only uses as an office for her translation work, this would qualify as an exclusive space. Jeremiah is a rideshare driver. He pays his personal and work bills at his kitchen table once a month. This would not qualify. Jeremiah decided to set up a small desk in the corner of his living room for doing his work-related bills and keeping all the records for his rideshare driving. In this case, the area of the living room with and immediately around the desk would qualify as exclusive use. Vanessa has an online craft business. She has a space she only uses for crafting and stores supplies in an area in her basement only used for crafting supplies. Vanessa can count both the crafting area and the storage area in her home office deduction. There are four steps you need to take in order to be ready to take the business use of home deduction. Let's run through all of them. First, calculating the space in your home you use for business. Second, understand both options for taking your deduction. Third, collecting allowable expenses when using the regular method, and last, deciding which method to use. Step one, calculating the space in your home you use for business. Typically, space is measured in the square feet of your home. You can then take the space used in your home for business and divide it by the total square footage of your home to get a percentage. With your total square footage, you want to include the garage, basement, and deck. 
but not any lawn or outdoor spaces. For example, let's say you use 200 square feet of your 1100 square foot home for your business. If you divide 200 by 1100, you get 0 0.18. By multiplying 0 0.18 by 100, you calculate that 18% of your home is used for your business. Step two, understand both options for taking your deduction. The IRS provides two options for deducting the business use of your home. You can use the regular method, which accounts for all the expenses associated with your home, and we'll talk about how to do that in step three. You can take a simplified method where the deduction is based on a set rate from the IRS if you are using 300 square feet or less of space in total. Our guide goes into depth on the pros and cons of each method. If you use the simplified method, know that the rate will be $5 per square foot. So, if you have a home office that occupies 125 square feet, your deduction would be 125 multiplied by $5 per square foot, which totals a $625 deduction. Using the simplified method, you just need to have your total square footage ready. If you want to use the regular method, you should move to step three. Step three, collecting allowable expenses for your home when using the regular method. Note that expenses that are for your home but are 100% related to your business can go on your Schedule C expenses for that category for the full amount. Here, we want to focus on collecting indirect expenses related to your home, such as electricity usage, which is partially for your business, but also partially for your personal use. Your deduction will be the total of all the indirect business expenses multiplied by the percentage of your home used for business. Let's continue from our example in step one, where you used 200 square feet of your home for business and the total home size is 1,100 square feet. Let's also say that your indirect costs were $14,000. First, determine the percentage of your home used for business by dividing 200 by 1,100 and get 18.18%. Next, you would multiply the total indirect costs by that percentage. So that is 18.18% of $14,000, resulting in a deduction of $2,545.20. This list includes many of the indirect home-based business expenses you can collect by looking at your receipts, bank accounts, credit card bills, checks, invoices, and at pay services like Zelle and Venmo. Make sure you have records of indirect expenses for your home, just like your other expenses. The guide includes a digital worksheet where you can track these expenses, which may include rent, mortgage interest and mortgage insurance payments, real estate property taxes, electricity, gas, oil, water, sewer, and other utilities, home telephone, internet, and cable, cleaning and lawn care services, and homeowners or renters insurance. Step four, deciding which method to use. In most cases, we recommend people choose to use the method that allows them to take the largest deduction. Remember, 
If you decide to use the regular method, you should only include expenses if you have receipts or documents to support your calculation. In our example, the simplified method would allow you to take a deduction of $1,000 and the regular method would allow you to take a deduction of $2,545.20. So you would decide which is the best method for you. Including business use of your vehicle. Many sole proprietors use their own car or truck in the course of their business. This could be as simple as the personal car that you also use in your Grubhub deliveries on weekends or a van that you purchase to transport equipment and goods for your business. Vehicle costs can add up, so keeping records of costs and knowing how to deduct them is important. There are two ways to deduct your vehicle expenses. The standard mileage rate provides a simple cost per mile that is used to calculate your deduction. The actual expense method uses all the costs of your car. If using the standard mileage rate, use the provided mileage log in the guide to keep track of the information needed for your mileage deduction. If you use your car a lot for your work, you may want to use the actual expense method. It requires more record keeping, but could result in a larger deduction. With the actual expense method, you will collect receipts or other proof of payment for all the expenses related to your car. These can include a variety of expenses. A worksheet is included in the guide that can help you collect the total amounts. There are pros and cons to this method. A pro is that it includes all the costs for your vehicle, from gas and tires to lease payments or depreciation. A con is that greater scrutiny and recording burden is placed upon you. Alternatively, you can use a simple IRS mileage rate. You will keep track of your miles, day, and purpose on a simple log or use an app. Unless you're using your vehicle very heavily for your business, the mileage method is usually easy and fair. Pros is that it is much easier to account for and less scrutiny of the deduction is involved. A con is that you are bound to the mileage rate which for 2022 was 58.5 cents from January 1st through June 30th and increased to 62.5 cents per mile for July 1st through December 31st of 2022. Regardless of the method you use, you will need a simple log with the date, the distance you went, where you went, the purpose, whether it was business or personal, and be as specific as possible. An example mileage log can be found in the resource section of the guide. There are also apps such as Mile IQ and Everlance, which can automatically track your trips and make them easier to log. The cost of these apps can also be deducted under other expenses. Keep in mind, when you use the standard mileage rate, you can still deduct parking fees and tolls accumulated as you are working. However, parking tickets and other violation fees are not deductible. If you have a dedicated work vehicle, all expenses will be business expenses. If you use your vehicle for both work and personal expenses, you will need to multiply the total of your actual expenses by the percentage of miles driven for work. To determine this, you take your mileage log and divide the miles driven for work by the total miles driven in the year. You then multiply your total expenses by this percentage. 
Understanding Depreciation Depreciation is a special method the IRS uses for deducting big expenses, which are considered assets, which are those over $2,500. This can be an expensive piece of equipment or the depreciation on the costs of your home or vehicle if you use them for business. Sometimes you may have to deduct these expenses over years, even if you paid it all in one year. This can sometimes surprise business owners who were anticipating deducting the cost in full. The number of years that you will deduct the item depends on what its useful life is. The IRS has helpful charts with useful life values for you to follow. Most tax softwares also calculates this for you. There are three special rules for depreciation that can help you deduct your depreciation faster. There is Section 179 Depreciation, which allows you to deduct in full the cost of tangible personal property, such as office equipment, furniture, vehicles, and most other assets that are not buildings or improvements to your building, including a home used for business. There is one catch, however. The item needs to be used for your business 50% or more of the time. The second special rule is known as bonus depreciation, which allows you to deduct 100% of certain assets in one year without an upper limit on the total amount you can deduct. To qualify for bonus depreciation, the item needs to have a useful life of 20 years or less, so it does not apply to your home. And it must be used for business 50% or more of the time. There are separate rules for vehicles, however. For vehicles under 6,000 pounds, you can expense $19,200. For vehicles over 6,000 pounds, but less than 14,000 pounds, they do not have a limit. Just like Section 179 depreciation, you need to use the vehicle at least 50% of the time based on the total miles driven and the amount of depreciation must be adjusted by the business use. Bonus depreciation will continue to be 100% through the end of 2022. In the following tax years, the percentage of depreciation allowed will decrease. Starting in 2023, when you will be limited to 80% of value, until it ends completely in December 2026. The third special rule is known as safe harbor for small taxpayers. This rule comes out of the IRS tangible property regulations and allows you to deduct repairs or improvements to your business location that is the lesser of $10,000 or 2% of the unadjusted basis. That is the value of the property less the value of the land. For example, let's say you had a business that was worth $350,000 and the land is worth $50,000. The unadjusted basis would be $300,000. 2% of the unadjusted basis would be $6,000. So an improvement like adding an awning that was $5,500 could be deducted in one year. With all three of these rules, it is important to note that state limitations can vary. So depreciation as I just described may only apply to your federal tax return. If using tax software, it will guide you through these decisions. Let's run through it step by step. 
Your software will do this, but it can help to know how it works so you aren't surprised. First, is the expense over $2,500? If yes, it is considered an asset which is subject to depreciation. Next, is it a repair? A repair can't add value, so it needs to be of similar function and materials. If it is a repair, it would not be subject to depreciation, but deducted as a repair and maintenance expense. Third, is this equipment or a land improvement? Equipment is broadly defined, so it can include a lot of things. Generally, an improvement extends the usable life or adds value to the property. Improvements must be depreciated. Fourth, if it is a facility improvement, is the total cost under $10,000? If so, there is a special rule for small taxpayers where you can still depreciate it all in one year. Fifth, there are other scenarios that may dictate whether an asset will need to be depreciated or if there are accelerated depreciation rules allowed for it. You should always consult guidance from your tax software, IRS guidelines, or even a tax professional if you are not certain. There are other resources included in the guide. This includes a tax rubric, which helps you assess your past taxes and learn how you can improve your filing. There's understanding payroll taxes for businesses with employees. There's quarterly estimated payments, understanding what these are and whether you need to make them or not. Opening a business bank account, which discusses the importance of a business bank account and how to go about opening one. There's creating a simple financial system in which every successful business needs a financial system. It doesn't have to be elaborate, but one that you use and helps you keep track of your revenue and expenses. And there's understanding depreciation which gives a more in-depth look at this sometimes complex but useful tax deduction. There are additional business tax and business resources. You can call 211 or visit 211.org to get connected to additional resources and services that can help you, your family, and your business. There's America's SBDC. Small business owners and aspiring entrepreneurs can go to their local SPDCs for free face-to-face -face business consulting and at-cost training on a variety of topics. There are nearly 1,000 local centers available to provide no-cost business consulting and low-cost training to new and existing businesses. Learn more about filing your return online in part two of this video. Thank you.